Hello, Ariella. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. And um, this is actually the first time that I have a conversation with someone so um, spontaneously, someone who I haven't spoken to before. I've been following your work for so long, but I haven't actually had a chance to speak to you in person. Oh, so I'm really, yeah, I'm really magic coming from that. <laughs> right, exactly. I feel like we have so much to talk about, you know, that there are so many threads that weave us together and um, we were just talking a little bit before and um, I come from a branch of feminine shamanism that's based in Italy um, and of course you teach all things feminine shamanism and and be magic and yeah. eros and all of the things and I hope that we'll be able to get to, <laughs> to a lot of them um, and so I suppose I'd love to hear from you First of all, what bee shamanism is for those people who don't know about it and how you, you got on the path. Certainly, I'd love to speak to that. Uh, interesting to me that you work with a branch of sh feminine shamanism in Italy and the kind of oldest roots that we know of, of bee shamanism traced back to ancient Greece and then Minoan Crete which predated classical Greek civilization. So really they're neighbors. And I think this is something that's so important to acknowledge in this kind of work that in some way it, it, it brings us into a sisterhood of what I, my colleague and I often speak to as womb shamanism, mm -hmm. which is these older feminine shamanic practices that or animistic practices, you could say, that have um, some very specific threads that are very, very um, like fine tuned, like the bee aspect, but also have these deeper kind of currents or rivers that are perhaps, we are probably branches of the same thing, which I think is um, great and fascinating. Yeah. So uh, succinctly bee shamanism, European bee shamanism, because I'm sure there are other types of uh, other cultures that work with the bee. European bee shamanism has its roots most recently in Celtic Britain, Lithuania, and then ancient Greece. It is often spoken of as indefinitely ancient and ever new. Indefinitely ancient meaning we actually don't know. You know, the, the, the matriarchal and womb shaman practices go way back beyond ancient Greece. But the ever new part I think is really important for anybody stepping into this work because it's a living tradition, which means it's always, um, it's morphing, it's changing, it's being, it, it's becoming alive and it's staying alive through the practice. And I think that this is so important when we work with the feminine and we work with this kind of um, shamanic practice, again, using a, a word that comes from a different culture, but it's the yeah. it's the best word at the time at, the, at this moment. Um, using these practices, we can. Oh, I just completely lost my train of thought. And anyway, <laughs> started thinking about Russia and the Tungus people and Siberia. right, like so many all the versions of shamanism, um, right? But yeah, bee shamanism ultimately is female centric. It's gynocentric, and by gynocentric, what that means is it's womb based. So it actually places a lot of import on the womb, on the womb as a healing vessel, and the connection between the womb and the honeybee or the hive. The easiest way I like to talk about that is that the, um, the bees seem to come from the womb of the earth and many cultures have seen the earth throughout time as a mother, as the mother. So the earth itself and the dark interior hollows of the earth are the womb spaces. Bees come from these spaces, from trees, from caves, from the earth itself in the spring, bringing life. And so there's this parallel between the beehive as a healing place and a place of alchemical change and the womb as the same within these ways. Gosh, wow, that's so beautiful. Um, when I do shamanic womb healings with people, I don't have a, a formal training as such. Everything has come back to me like to me through my lineage and through my channeling, as it were. 
And I've seen these places inside the womb. You know, when I go into the womb and do these shamanic healings, I can see these places. Um, and these places of ancestry and the goddess and the way that, you know, she speaks to us. Um, but more recently, I've been seeing these hives with a bee in them. And I just found that fascinating because I didn't fully know exactly what that meant until I was looking at your work and I realized, you know, of, of course I know that it's that it's a very ancient tradition, but I was interested in that symbology. And I think it's to do with that, that oracle of the womb. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we haven't even spoken of the, the bee connection to the oracular work, but yeah. And how is that? Like, how do you, how does that like, um, cause I know that you have a school and you're also teaching people how to connect to that. And I'm wondering how do you get people to, you know, or even introduce the subject to get people to look into their womb space and start to think of it as that as an oracle. Good, good question. Um, <laughs> Yes. Okay. So f first and foremost, historically, there is a connection between the bee and the womb, uh, sorry, the bee and Delphi, which is where prophecy was given in ancient Greece for over a thousand years. I'm sure you know this, but just for anybody listening. Um, and she was spoken of as the Delphic bee. She was a Melissa. A Melissa are the bee, pri bee priestesses of ancient Greece, um, or bee women, I often call them as well. And and there are other bee priestesses dedicated to Demeter, to Aphrodite, et cetera, et cetera. But at Delphi, the um, the priestess offering prophecy would go into a lower chamber within the temple structure and connect with the depth of the earth. I often said she was inhaling the breath of Python, the serpentine life force energy beneath the earth. Um, and inhaling that up through the womb and then speaking or uttering through her upper mouth. So we actually speak to the yoni as the lower mouth and the voice or the, the this is the upper mouth. We speak to the womb as the first brain and this part is the second brain. Um, and it's, these are, this is within a tradition, but I think that you already said it very clearly. These are things that are inherent in us. And when teaching people to reconnect to the womb, we have to first address that there is a cultural disconnect that's 2,000, 3,000 years old where women's spirituality and women's connection to their bodies and the connection to the earth was systematically and consciously suppressed. Yeah. So there, even if you feel very cool about your body and your womb connection, you can go into just just orienting. So what do I do to begin? We begin with darkness and we begin with breath. So we go into the sense of the womb is a safe, dark place. The, there's the wombic cosmos. There's the womb of the earth. And so we drop into a sense of darkness as an ally and breathe ourselves down into the womb. And as if that is the seat, as if that is where we're seeing from, hearing from. In dream work, we often say, listen to the dream with womb awakened ears. Mm. You perceive the dream with womb awakened eyes. And when that happens, sometimes ancestral things get triggered, family lineage stuff gets triggered, even just societal stuff around disconnect from this place as a healing vessel as an all-knowing vessel we speak to the womb as the library of womankind which i love wow. i love that it's just like yes that makes so much sense access to the library of womankind and it's also an oracular vessel so this dark interior creative life force place is also the place that we have knowing from I like to say knowing because it's um, it takes it out of it needing to be an image or clairaudience or clairsentience or clairvoyance into ways that we sometimes just, we have so many ways of knowing and sometimes it's just a felt sense. Right, the knowing under the surface of things. Yeah, yeah. that's so beautiful. And then you, you touched on it a little bit but this sort of going into that underworld then leads you into this dream world and yeah. so mm -hmm. and th those boundaries kind of become blurred as well the more you practice don't they but I'd say so um, 
Very much. Yeah. One of the symbols we work with within the bee tradition is the figure eight. So, um, you know, this way. Oh, yeah. So the lemniscate, yeah, that's the um, Latin word for a lemniscate. So mm -hmm. it's this moving current of energy. We sometimes perceive that in the womb um, as like a, as a way to get a golden lemniscate to help tonify that area. Um, but it also is the language of the bee. It's how the honey bee dances her ecstatic dance of love and eros and connection and communion with the flower that she's just experienced. She brings that story back to the hive and she dances that story on the comb and that dance creates vibration and that vibrates through the hive and it creates a sense of ecstatic well-being that there's this beautiful food source and the flowers are in bloom. Um, so we work with that symbol quite a bit and it's a really wonderful symbol to talk about that ability to go betwixt and between, which is also a big connection with the bees. The bees go between, they have been seen throughout many cultures, including this one, as a being that can go between this world and the other world. So the, between the world of dreams and the world of waking and between the world of spirit or the other side of the veil and different ways to talk about that and our current reality. And this symbol for me has become a really wonderful way to learn how to tra traverse the terrain of being in the mundane and then being in the altered state and then being in the mm -hmm. mundane again and how how they are separate but they're part of the same road that you can traverse um so bringing people into the womb and into the dark one of the ways we can do that is to connect our upper body with the lower body of the earth using that symbol or connect our womb with like as if we're creating a current between the lower the earth itself or the chthonic or the subterranean as a healing holy place and bringing drawing that energy up filling the womb up um, wow a lot of different practices that we do with filling the womb up with earth energy or star energy Oh my goodness, it's so similar. Yeah, it's it's absolutely similar. We we have practices as well where we're drawing the life force energy up from the earth. Yep. For, <laughs> you know, into that energy um, and the sensations in the body. You know, there's yes. that place where it's more embodied. Let's say where you're feeling that that orgasmic life force energy move through the body, and then it rises up. And of course, there's that meeting place with the where the the cosmos energy comes down and meets in the heart and then of course in the womb as well mm -hmm. and yeah. I've often, Very yeah, simple. Absolutely. yeah. <laughs> I've often seen that shape as well the figure of eight mm -hmm. um typically with a golden line running through it so I wonder if like subliminally I was also you know tapping into bee shamanism but there is a yeah. a lot of this symbology that's very similar and I think that that's so important to recognize like, this in itself, this conversation to me, like, this is the thing, this is it, everyone, because we we often have this longing, at least in the West, this like, spiritual hunger for like, where's lineage and where's my connection and, I, you know, like, where's my land, all that kind of stuff. And and we we come from, you know, we're, we live in a Christocentric world, uh, more or less. So there's this sense of who's the authority. And yeah. what I love about this type of embodiment work is your body becomes a temple, your body becomes a sacred tool. You get to discover, you know, you, you've you had the figure eight show up and the beads show up and you don't have to have anybody tell you that that's the way or not. There isn't a way, it's more of a this in, innate connection. And when you start to make those and go, oh yeah, us too, I've seen that too. That is, it's so juicy and exciting. It is, it's like codes as well that are just traveling through time and space, you know, and, and that we're able to tap into. I love that. And, um, but let's talk about Eros because you use the word Eros a lot. And I would love to know um, your take on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that I would say was suppressed when women's spirituality was suppressed was the innate vitalic 
sexual life force energy of the earth. And, um, and that energy really became very narrow and it had to be used for specific things like procreation. Whereas when we connect to this idea of Eros as inherent and beautiful and healing and reviv revivifying um, and like to bringing wisdom, we start to see it beyond the personal. It becomes the impersonal, um, although it affects the personal. And that's where we start to connect with it um, as this life force energy moving through nature. But it's not just life force, it's almost like we can connect to the sensuous. So the best example often, if you, if you really wanna know, is go watch a bee with a flower. There's love poems throughout the centuries written about the bee and the flower. The way the bee completely um, covers herself in the scent and the color and the, and the light of the flower. But anyone has experienced this. Anyone who's, you know, jumped into that like perfect temperature summer pool, you know, summer river pool and felt that on their skin or, you know, felt the warmth of a campfire against them on a beautiful night or been in, um, you know, run their hands through soft grass. It's sensuous. It's connected to life force. It's very inherently connected to nature. And that can become something we draw in. Just like we're drawing in the earth energy to the womb, we can draw in that quality and use it to infuse the book we're writing or infuse the meal we're cooking or healing. So this energy is actually used actively in bee shamanism methodologies, methodologies for healing. Ah. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. And does that cover a wide variety of healing? Um, yeah. 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 With different modalities, lots of different. I think most shamanic traditions have a lot of different types of healings involved, but we work with the womb. Um, the, the womb is always present as the practitioner in healing, but also and we often work in a quiet or darker space to make it wombic. And then there's, mm -hmm. you know, we have different tools we use. Here's one of them. Yeah. This is the staff. Wow. A representative of the female the female line. Um, oh, yeah. the staff tradition of weaving, which That's is powerful. female spirituality. Um, we work with what we call the interior garden, which is a system of roses and stars within connected to the endocrine system. Um, yeah, there's a lot of oh, different so things. And recently, I even saw um, a an Egyptian hieroglyph where there was an ank, which we work with a lot in in as a force to move that life force energy through sure. that represents the the human body as well. And I saw these two bees, bee hieroglyphs, either side of this ank from 3500 BC and it was oh, just love to so mind that. blowing to me. So the connection between bees and sort of life, death and resurrection and that whole process. I love all the magic, but as a beekeeper, it's, it's really nice to actually look at the biology because there's inherent magic in the biology and honeybees are one of those rare examples of a being that seems to, um, regenerate itself. That's why they're connected to the priestesshoods of Parthenogenesis, which means virgin birth. So the old Greek cults of virgin birth, um, virgin meaning pure, not meaning virgin as in chaste in the way we yeah. talk about it now, right? right. <laughs> they, they can, you know, there's the mother colony and in the spring, the, the mother of that colony leaves, they raise a new mother or a new queen inside that colony and she leaves with about half the bees and they re it's a regeneration process so when when cultures or when people saw that it became this inherent symbol of ever renewing life you know, i think the other great example of that is the serpent who sheds its skin and oh. those two are very inter interrelated we work with the serpent and the bee oh that's wonderful and the serpent as well as a symbol of the goddess and life force energy yeah yeah Gosh, wow. Yeah, we could geek out for ages. <laughs> um, how is it being a beekeeper? Well, um, 
<laughs> it's so interesting. This is the weirdest year I've ever experienced as a beekeeper because um, I had a, I, I gave birth in February, which is at the beginning of bee season in California. And so I've been the most hands off I've ever been and just kind of living with them on my land and my land I rent. Yeah. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I think being a beekeeper in the in 2021 takes incredible um, heart and takes incredible courage because they are one of the things we can do with the land or the earth that brings us most in contact with the current climate crisis, biodiversity loss, um, mm -hmm. and can bring up eco grief. And I think we have to, we have to come to that place of that eco grief and like what Joanna Macy talks about in terms of, um, really confronting the, the grief of our times and with environmentalism. We have to work through that grief to then create change. Um, but you can't keep bees without noticing the seasons changing. You can't right. keep bees in California without losing hives to wildfire smoke. You know, it's, it's yeah. a very, um, it's an honor and it's intense and beautiful and, um, creates a level of devotion that I, uh, I just keep deepening into. It's um, a wonderful devotion to this earth that they bring about in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so profound. And also being able to live with your teachers in some way, yeah. uh, teach you every day. And we're talking about things that are in a way in the quantum realm or the unseen realm when we work with them shamanically. And, but you get to sort of, really be so close to the tangible reality of the energy of the bee and, and they and then, do yeah. communicate it's very you know they're they're they just don't communicate with you know eyes and ears like a dog or <laughs> anything like that with words but yeah yeah one of my best examples i remember recently i was last year i was in a hive and i was taking photos um because i do and it was a hot summer day and I got distracted. I actually walked away because I was hot, left the hive open just for a couple of minutes to go into the shade to see if I got the shot I wanted, which was very inconsiderate. Um, I don't get stung very often, but I was about 20 feet away and one of the bees from the hive came over and stung the thumb that was scrolling. Oh, wow. And I immediately heard the message like, what are you doing? It's hot. It's like we're, you're letting the scent of honey out into the open close us up. <laughs> like, don't be rude. And it was just a very, very clear communication. So they're, they're good communicators. There's nothing clearer than, than that. You know, yeah. that, <laughs> that psychic connection is real. Yeah. yeah. So um, with my students in Temple, we, we do a lot of dream work too. And I know that that's one of your specialities. And in the, um, in the Italian tradition, there is a dreaming tradition. Um, oh, I think you're all about it. <laughs> like a, a meditative trance state tradition um, that we go into. And then that, can, of course, merges with the dream time. And mm -hmm. you know, we, we work with the dream time actively and with intention. Yeah. And so, yeah. So how um, how have the bees taught you to dream? Yeah. So, um, gosh, it sounds so similar. I love this. It's really <laughs> I just want to know everything about you. <laughs> yeah. um, I teach a course called Dreaming with Bees, and it's um, it is that we do work with intentional dreaming with the bees, and in some ways, it's also a misnomer because it's dreaming within the bee tradition. And so there's a couple of things going on. One is that the bees are, they're dream bringers. They exist in the in-between. So we work with dreaming with them as in inviting them in as a presence, the sisterhood of the hive and brotherhood. There are the wonderful drones and singers within the hive as well. Um, bringing that into our dream field with this idea that, um, that that is a spirit it's an active spirit it wants to engage with you and if you, that invitation to have them influence your dreams versus dreaming about bees this is not a dreaming about bees kind of situation although sometimes you do um and it's really interesting watching people over the years teaching these these courses there's certain themes that always show up on you know the weeks that we're actively working with the bee aspect 
versus other weeks where we might be working with the serpent or working with dreaming a healing dream. So ultimately, within these ways, we're working with intentional dreaming, uh, which sounds like something you you do as well, where you're you're working in your dreams, you're setting an intention, you're dreaming with spirit, or you're dreaming on a theme, you're dreaming for knowledge, you're dreaming for healing, and you're asking spirit to meet you through that intention and then really choosing to to be met as well and it takes time to sort of map or craft your dreams but the other side of it and this is where the more the the bee shamanism comes in is that there's a there's very much an active awake altered state um, aspect to this work so we have something called dream mirroring which can be done uh, with the, wo the womb or the heart um, uh, it really, of course, because it is open to more than one gender <laughs> yes. and, uh, and other areas in the body that are, that are potent areas, but those are two that I readily work with because they're more accessible for people. Um, and if we were to speak from the womb, for instance, you would listen in a darkened room to the dream with a with a companion or a group a small group of people and each person would share a dream so let's say you shared a dream with me i would close my eyes i would drop into my womb i would listen from the womb and then i would allow a mirror to arrive and a mirror is not an interpretation but more like you're answering the dream with dream language so it could be a question or a knowing or an image that shows up or uh, lines of a song or a sensation in the body like oh wow are you talking about that I felt this tingling going up my right leg and then a, like a, something in, happened in my hand that kind of stuff and the mirror if I'm marrying you I don't know necessarily what's going on in your life or what that has to do with things and you might not know either but more often than not a mirror actually answers something for the person um, that helps reveal their dreams so if we're doing it in a hive collective with maybe six people it's the number of the bee you're getting all these faceted sides of mirrors and you come away with this sort of flowered dream versus you know what what you thought it might have meant or felt you know you think you have a dream it's like yeah it's nothing i don't got much today you guys and then you share it and the mirrors come back and like, okay <laughs> that's, that's a lot yeah it's fun Incredible really fun and beautiful practice yeah and I feel everything in my body too perhaps I've been mirroring doing this mirroring <laughs> practice without knowing it but you know I think this is one way to talk about something that's inherent you know this happens to be called dream mirror I and mean, it happens to be using aspects of the beat of bee shamanism but feeling something in the body and mirroring that back is it's like that's that's in us so. It's a form of channeling, which we can do as multidimensional beings, you know, as we're waking up. Mm. And and you actually mentioned the gender thing. And I don't know if you found this also, but um, I, I tend to now just call it the womb space. And I sometimes do womb readings for uh, masculine identified beings or feminine identified beings who don't necessarily have an anatomical, you know, uterus womb. Mm -hmm. Because I feel that it's the shamanic space. Mm -hmm. that we're going into that's the point or that's you know yeah. in a way I mean, perhaps not exactly the same but it it resonates you know there's the there's some energy there that can be found in the womb space I love that a shamanic I, place yeah. yeah 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 I use similar language I think I, I sometimes call it the womb space I say wombic consciousness at times mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I work with a lot of people who are non-binary and um, I feel it's incredibly important to to have this work be something that is both of the anatomy for, for women with wombs who are working on healing that part of their body, absolutely. But there are lots of people who weren't born with wombs who are who identify as masculine or male, who maybe had a hysterectomy, whatever it is. and want to connect with that spiritual center, but not necessarily, don't necessarily have it. Or I even have um, students who are, who were born uh, with a womb, but 
don't identify with it and want to work with the consciousness, not the physical aspect in their body, which is fascinating. So we work with, you know, the cosmic womb. We work with the earth as the womb. Um, we were, I, I have absolutely worked with men and the womb is a healing space. I remind everyone that every, we were all birthed from a womb. So every one of us has intimate knowledge of the womb. Yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I loved how you explained that. It was beautiful and very comprehensive. Yeah, I think that, that really sums it up. We have well, it's a mirror that. to what you're saying. You know, you're saying the same thing, you do the same thing. It's it's I love that that is what's coming through at this time. Yeah. It feels like some of the work people like you and I are doing is creating this soft like foundation of the divine feminine, the sacred feminine, through which a new form of of um, the he she, mm -hmm. the sacred energy, and and the divine masculine can arise and arrive, because there's this this shifting in how we how we work. Right, moving towards this unity consciousness, mm -hmm. we evolve as human beings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but one last question about um, the more uh, with a more historical basis because I'm curious and I wonder if you know. I have seen some uh, bee hives. I suppose it was like some bee symbology um, in Magdalen temples and in Templar hidden Templar temples. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there is a connection there? Well, I, I'm thinking. I'm of sure. The beehive symbol is a symbol for the Masonic temples, which connected to the Templars. Mm -hmm. The beehive and the chalice and the cup and the womb are all interrelated symbols. Um, bees were also perceived as uh, heavenly beings. So, for instance, in ancient Egypt, the tears of Ra, the sun god, were seen as bees. Well, that also became something for Christ. Um, he also produced tears that became bees. So you can see how things get passed along. Um, I think that ancient sense of the beehive being the place of birth, death, and resurrection yeah. is something that really got taken in by Christianity and also specifically by like mythic sacred Christianity connected to the Magdalene because the she is yeah the mystic exactly um and the that womb book consciousness but I don't I don't know I didn't know that that was the case so I'm yeah. very oh, that's beautiful I, that that totally makes sense to me like um I I work a lot with mystical Christianity probably also because of my roots <laughs> and sort of you know my my work to empower um our wombs and ourselves again after the church you know created so much doubt. yeah um, and um Magdalene mysteries seem to it, you know, I would say like one in every five people who come my way have some kind of connection to the Magdalene Mysteries. They seem to be very intertwined. Um, and it was a Mag Magdalene pilgrimage that kind of brought me to this tradition in a way. Interesting. Oh, yeah. really? What? How is that? Um, they went hand in hand. I, um, the, the, I had read the book, The Shamanic Way of the Bee, written by Simon Buxton. I wanted to get into the course here, but I, in, in the UK, sorry, um, but I had to wait. And so I, I went on a Magdalene pilgrimage instead. Um, mm. I actually started at Glast in Glastonbury and connected with, like accidentally at a cafe um, and then randomly on the side of a road as I was trying to find a sacred oak with a woman who wrote um, a book about the sacred Mary Magdalene called um, the Book of Love and the Expected One. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Um, oh God, Kathy McKay. I know. Yeah, I don't really know her name. Yeah, she was with us. A woman named Annie Williams, who is also a sound healer working with an ancient Egypt Egyptian lineage. It yeah. was a very interesting experience, um, and I 
happened to be going to one of the places right after that where her book took place um, in uh, connected to the labyrinth and there were there were just so many synchronicities on that trip that sort of opened doorways for me to be able to return to England because at that point in my life there was there's no way I could afford coming back to England to study this obscure folk tradition <laughs> you know but there were it, they're just a, I do it's a long story but lots of synchronicity mm -hmm. and I think that that's often true when we one find the path that we're meant to be on and two connect in with the bees or the divine feminine or these this kind of mythic sacred spirituality that leads us on with breadcrumbs Absolutely. And so there is a Celtic connection there too. Is there a Druidian? Celtic? Certainly. Um, my teacher's teacher, so, well, one of the, <laughs> Simon Buxton, who yeah. I actually have taken a class with, but I, I know him and um, we've met him. Uh, he works with the, I guess you could say the masculine line, but this work is typically taught masculine is not the right way to say that this work is typically taught by women to men and women and so his wife naomi um teaches this work in workshops as well as some other women um at the sacred trust he also teaches at the sacred trust but he teaches classic shamanism uh, infused with this work his teacher was a welsh man um and for a while a lot of the kind of the more private version of this work before it became public. Uh, the people were in Celtic Britain, in Wales and England. Um, and there's so much of that kind of Celtic other world approach to the work. So I find that the way the Celts approach, the Celtic spirituality approaches the other world as not another place, but something that's all around us all the time that we can kind of slip into and out of. Uh, and it's very um, permeable. There's a veil between this world and the next, and we can, uh, there are times when that veil is thinner and we can access teachings, wisdom, spirits, all of that. Um, we work with three sisterhoods within this work, the sisterhood of the wise maidens, the sisterhood of the spinners, and the sisterhood of the fae. And the sisterhood of the fae folk, that's, that has a very kind of Celtic resonance to it. Um, it has an Arthurian connection, and it's this idea that there's a sisterhood of women of both behind the veil and in this current incarnation that are tutelary spirits and um, women who connect particularly within this sisterhood to the fey folk as teachers that the, the sisterhood learned their arts directly from the fey folk and when i say fey folk i mean in some ways like nature spirits um, but there's a certain tonality when you say fey folk that really is quite celtic if that yeah. makes sense yes absolutely it's recalling a specific frequency yeah yeah this is so fascinating. I feel like there's a movie somewhere in here. Like someone, someone could make I guess so. <laughs> entry, you know, you know, spanning all of these traditions and following following the line of the bee. I think it's so interesting because it's not um, it's not linear. The bees never are, and, and every once yeah. in a while, a bee line somewhere, but they're right, not. right. <laughs> we often call this the crooked path. Like it's it's not going to. You're not going to, if you're trying to get from A to B, you're probably going to go to like from like A to M to Z back to this and then maybe end up at B, but B is now in a different dimension. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and by, by the time you get there, it's not even like the goal anymore. You're like, oh, interesting. I just passed by B. That was a lifetime. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's one. when it comes to like tracing this in, a, in the form of a documentary or a movie or a film, I'd be fascinated to see what happened. Because... How you could connect those dots. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not dogmatic and it's not, there's no book written. It's just, it's inherent spirituality that rises up in us that you can obviously connect into through your lineage and through your remembrance. And I do as well, and there's things being added to it that's coming through the ever new aspect of the tradition, people who are in practice now, mm. discovering more, bringing more forward, so. Wow. Yes, I mean, honestly, I learned just through working with life force energy, and yeah. that life energy just kept opening up channels and opening up channels, and I was just practicing doing womb mm. readings for people, and certain symbology kept coming in, 
Yeah. So it's the, the, so affirming when you do that. And like, voice and it, <laughs> talking, like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and there is a place, of course, for guidance and study and and sort of anchoring these yeah. energies in. And I always find that it's really interesting to channel something and then to go and find it in, you know, an ancient book or something like that and sort of really just allow it to land in your system. And you'll see that there's a resonance there yeah. that just feels like truth again and again. Mm -hmm. And so you build your you sort of build a foundation. You do, and that, that takes a discipline. You know, it's yeah. an instant gratification culture. This kind of work um, doesn't leave a lot of room for that approach. You have to have that discipline and that cultivation and that patience and that time. And honoring and a reverence. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I speak to how this is, is innate in all of us, but I, I do really um, feel it's important to honor the lineage and honor my teachers and their teachers and, you know, the, the bee mistress who was in Lithuania before she passed and her teachers and on and on from there. Of course, and our ancestry and yes. mm -hmm. our DNA, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in that same shape. <laughs> yeah. Little helix. Yeah. Yeah. Figure eight. Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Gosh, the yeah, the mysteries are infinite. Mm -hmm. So with with all that being said, where can people come and, and reach you and learn from you? And um yeah. So um my website is honeybewild.com. My Instagram, which I'm very active on, um, probably even more than my website is beekeeping and skirts. And I, I do both, you know, I exist in both worlds. So the actual practical aspects of beekeeping, I do a women's apprenticeship yearly um, for beekeeping and connecting with the sacred feminine. And then I do a lot of dream work and oracular work. Um, I do dream sessions for people, oracular sessions for people, and I teach dream classes. Um, in the, the summer, I have a Dreaming with Bees class. I teach it quarterly. It runs five weeks and it's all audio. So you, you sit in a listening state versus a watching state. And then I'm actually teaching for the Shift Network starting in July. I'm teaching a dreaming class that's very specifically about working with the interior garden and working with embodiment of your dreams and you know, dreaming through the body. I'm excited about that one. It'll be last, uh, I think a seven week class with the shift network. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah that's great. So there's lots of ways to, to plug in over the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm so inspired by your work. It's just so incredible. I could go on speaking forever. <laughs> I want to interview you now. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah. To, to talk Is that a drum behind you? Do you work with the drum? I do, yes. Yeah, I do. That's um, a beautiful instrument for this work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The sound, as you were saying as well, that, you know, and the sound of the bees, I'm sure, is very powerful. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, um, Ariella. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so happy that we had this chance to get together, and I'm sure that we'll cross paths again and I really look forward to to learning more from you and yeah, yeah you're sitting down and have a cup of tea metaphorically or actually in person someday yeah. <laughs> absolutely and I know your Instagram is wonderful and people can like really connect to all the, the wonderful things that you're holding as you say you're holding both worlds you know different aspects of this work so it's really really a treasure yeah well thank you for the the work you're doing and that I'm just so happy to see that this, um, I guess this face of the sacred feminine in the womb space is resonating for so many and showing up in such a beautiful way in various lineages. It's, yeah. it's time and right. we need right. it. Revival. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. So I will leave you on that note. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so it's been much. A Thank you so much. And um, we will see you soon. Okay. <laughs>